The next speaker is Clark Jorgensen. Uh, he, he received his bachelor's degree in physics with a minor in mathematics from Montana State and his bachelor's from Montana Tech in geophysics. He worked for three years for Kennecott Exploration and for the past 17 years has been self-employed at Big Sky Geophysics where his field work processing and interpretation for mineral exploration. The title of his talk today is Project Scale Exploration Using GRACE Satellite Gravity Data. I'd like to talk about um, incorporating satellite gravity data from the GRACE Satellite System in, uh, around geophysics. Using Um, there are currently three satellite systems that are operating the dedicated gravity satellites. The CHAMP system was launched in 2000 and was monitored by the German research group. It consists of one vertical accelerometer to measure gravitational perturbations. GRACE consists of two satellites, each with a vertical accelerometer in each one. And then more recently, and that's monitored or administered by NASA, more recently the European Space Agency launched the GOSI system, which is a three component accelerometer, and it also is orbiting at a much lower altitude, so it's, good, it's obtaining more detailed data than the previous satellites. I'm not really sure the horizontal components of the accelerometers increase the accuracy a lot, but they, you know, certainly the lower altitude is definitely generating higher resolution data. And then the final thing is this EGM-08 model, the Earth Gravity Model, that's been produced by the NGA, that's the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, formerly known as uh, NEMA and the Defense Management Agency. They have merged ground data from various sources around the globe with this satellite data to improve a gravity model for the entire Earth. Um, here's just an artist's rendition of what the, the two gray satellites look like in orbit. It's actually two separate satellites each satellite has a single component accelerometer in it. They're connected by a radial wavelength so that not only are measuring the perturbations caused that are measured by the accelerometer, you're also measuring the perturbations of the two satellites relative to, to, to each other. And their positions are also monitored by the GPS satellite network so that you can get much more precise um, positions and gravitational accelerations than you could with just a single satellite. The EGM 2008 terrestrial data sources, of course, the primary source is just the, the data that's <coughs> derived from the satellites and average and continue to average it to try to improve the accuracy of the model. And so we've been including with several ground sources, including um, marine gravity data that's been collected on shipboards, airborne gravity surveys. Most notably, uh, the NGA flew an airborne survey over all of the country of Mongolia and has provided high resolution gravity data for that mineral perspective country. Uh, various public gravity databases have been merged into it, and there's also the NGA gravity databases, where they have turned, obtained those from various companies and from countries that aren't necessarily public domain. And the nice thing about this is that we don't necessarily have access to that data, but it's been incorporated in some models, so it's kind of a backdoor way to get some gravity data that you can't otherwise get out. And then, of course, the proprietary ground, data, ground gravity databases from various com com companies. Looking at a map of the globe, seeing where these sources come from. Uh, red means there's no data. Gray means it's proprietary of the source from various locations, and green is unrestricted. Of course, for Antarctica, there's there's no information, so the, the uh, satellite model is not really constrained at all by any ground data. The oceans are actually quite well defined because they have, they have various radar tracking satellites and monitoring the average elevations of the, the Earth's oceans and then if you subtract out the storms and average you'd be a very good model of the first geo just from that radar satellites going over the oceans. <clears throat> Here's a map of various sources and where they again for Antarctica it's only def defined by the gray satellites themselves. Uh, most of the, the gray areas are the ones where, where the countries that have public domain gravity databases. Um, for here in the northern USSR they they have donated, Russia's donated some of their data to this database from the Arctic study. Uh, other areas include, you, know, you can see the, the airborne uh, gravity from Mongolia. 
and also here I'd like to put it out there. Ethiopia and Eritrea over here also have um, pretty good gra ground gravity data. Ethiopia, Eritrea won its independence from Ethiopia after the Civil War. Prior to that, the Soviet Union was active in exploration in Ethiopia, and so they have actually a good, I think, fairly good database, unfortunately. We can't access it, but it is incorporated in this one. It becomes important for one of the case studies. Um, and so you have the satellite gravity data, and then there, there's a very sophisticated way to one merge at the ground data based sources. And the, the of course the first thing is it's a nonlinear problem. You have to do a rich regression. So you have to just basically assume it's more or less a linear problem so that we can apply our mathematical techniques to solve that. Translate the spherical um, satellite coordinates to ellipsoidal coordinates and they're downward continued to the reference ellipsoid. And then merge at the ground data bases, cross check that with the various sources, see which ones are more reliable to have. Uh, to be in question and place weighting elements on all those different sources so that when you do this inversion, you want to put the most of your weight on what you consider your most um, accurate source of data. And then in the end, they finally produce a free air anomaly for the entire globe at a five arc minute interval, which is roughly nine kilometers, which isn't great, but for a satellite, it's pretty good. And then you want to look at error terms, or what they estimate their error terms is based upon this. And of course, you can see where, the, where the best, they have the best ground control from the ground data is they estimate their error to be much lower in the blues, which of course is like Australia, North America. And of course, it's, it's horrible because I mean, there's no ground data like Antarctica. Um, and it, it's probably pretty poor in some of these areas too, like in South America, there are very few ground gravity stations. And again, note here in Eritrea, they actually they estimate their error would be fairly decent. After they, the, the defense mapping agency, or, or GNA, they produce a free air anomaly, because that's the main thing they're concerned about. They're the, it's a military organization, and they're interested in the risk gravitation of because they have, you know, if you fire a ballistic missile at somebody, that the trajectory will be affected by the gravitational field. So they're, they're trying to blow people up more accurately. So that's, their whole interest is just for the free air for the anomaly. But the International Gravity Bureau, located in France, went ahead and they wanted to process to create new gay anomalies that people would use for exploration. And so they've converted the free air anomalies to new gay anomalies, uh, the group led by a guy named uh, Fou, who using that program, the FA to Bouge. We discretize the anomalies down to hopefully a size that we're not compromising the accuracy too much but adding additional detail. So they discretize it down to two and a half arc minutes. And then they apply terrain corrections using the whole e one one minute elevation set for the entire globe. And then they've posted all this data on their website. I, I didn't include a link to the website since it's a government site and those tend to change, but if you just type in International Gravity Bureau and you're searching them, you should be able to find it. It's, it's pretty easy to find. The first case that I have to talk about is, is Eritrea. It's a potash exploration program in the Bada Basin. There is um, some companies that are Operating high uh, quality, high grade potash mines just south of the border in Ethiopia. A company I was looking for sand resources wanted to try to find those in the bottom basin where it stands up in Eritrea. Only very general geology is north of the basin and there's no depth information whatsoever. They wanted to do just a quick geophysical program to try to estimate the uh, geometry of the, this basin to pick out the best place to drill holes. So they decided on just a very limited gravity surface with four profiles and there's an about 25 lines of ground magnetic data. Here just for a location map, you, you can see Eritrea in the middle of the map there. Uh, the bottom basin is right here, so the project area is right about there. And that's of course the that's the middle. And you can see the three profiles that are designed to go across this basin don't have a shape that's familiar to me at all from any I see the gravity go up on both sides when you look back in the bedroom. Here you can see there's a very strong gradient going to the uh, east, and that's it's caused by the central African rift. But when you look at these lines and you try to figure out what, what is the regional and what's caused by the basin, it's very hard to interpret because you just have these three, three or four isolated lines covering the basin. How can you constrain that to try to model what kind of basin depths whatsoever? And so I was looking for various regional gravity bases, and I happened to find that website. Gravity, and found where they have 
understand that and say, I don't need it. So I'm going to pull it up and see if I can help you. They also collected the ground magnetic data. Unfortunately, we're operating about 10 degrees north of latitude. And for those of you familiar with the reduction of the polar filter and the reduction of the polar filter, they don't work very well at low latitude areas. They tend to swing out really badly, and I tried both, and they look just horrible. Um, Dick West recommended me to use the MAG3D inversion program from UTC. What you do is you solve for the, the magnetic susceptibilities in the ground using the inversion code, and then you reproduce the reduced pull map by saying that, all right, let's see what kind of field that produces if you were ready for this data by the pull. And it creates a nice map that, that you can, I can look at and make sense to me. And here it is laid on top of the geology map. Again, the area of white is the, is the bottom basin itself with various outcropping of geologies. And you can see that, you know, where the locates these now more magnetic bodies corresponds to the, the margins where you would expect them you know, to be more magnetic rocks. In the basin itself, which is just an evaporate basin, you don't really expect any magnetic rocks, and we're not we have using the proper uh, filter for that, for that inversion technique. So we have these four profile lines. They decided one line was really not in their area of interest. So there's the red outline is the outline for that, that geologic map to the three main profiles that went across it. And if you look at, this is the satellite graph, or the EGM-08 here on the, on the right-hand side of the three isolated profiles on the left. And you can see the profiles actually agree very well with what's shown in the EGM-08 database. You can see that all three are, have, have the, the are increasing to the east as expected. In line two, you've got like a little hump here to come to come in the middle, which is about there. And on line three, you're coming up to a crest right there, as, as you can see in the that data. It looks like a reasonable fit. And not only do the, the shapes of the lines fit, the, the actual amplitude of the line is very well. So going by that, we've got some magnetic data and we've got some gravity data. We can go ahead and do a kind of a crude two and a half D inversion of that very limited data. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to invert it. The top profile is the, the observed gravity data, that's the black line. The blue is the model data. And the three red dots are the regional that's been taken out, and that's based solely on the EGM. 08 data. If I didn't have that, that regional data based on the EGM 08, I'd really have no clue as what to pick my, my background at. Um, the second panel here is the, is the magnetic data. Of course, it's very noisy, but using reasonable susceptibilities, we're, we're generally fit the shape. This, is, of course, here is the, is the basin over here. We're starting that. That's the basin over there. And you get a reasonable fit. And if you do it over all three lines, you're trying to do it simultaneously. We just use three, or I use three blocks here to, to model the basin in the center, four blocks to model the outcropping rocks on the other side. Crude model, but we can get very decent fits in all three lines by just doing you know, some simple, simple bodies, reasonable estimates of density and susceptibilities. No, no samples for any of that stuff, so we're just kind of taking reasonable estimates. So with the limited ground data, we, we were able to get a, a decent fit that looks reasonable for the geology of the basin. Uh, the EGM-08 was used to establish the medium, regional gradient. Um, able to use the mag 3 d inversion code to get a reasonable uh, reduced whole magnetic image that we could incorporate into the inversion as well. Using the joint inversion and modeling, able to get a decent estimate of the, the shape and depth of the, the basin. The program, they only, they only drilled several wider space, shallow holes, no economic, no potash actually at all. Was the and they, they decided to draw. It was not really an interesting company. But the point of that is that they were able to, you know, quickly evaluate the program at the minimum cost. We just uh, let's take a look at this. If it looks good, we'll keep going. If not, we can move on. The second example is much closer to here. It's in the Great Basin. It's for gold exploration on the western bank of the, the um, Sheep Creek Range, just north of Battle Mountain, near the Snowstorm Mine. There's an old USGS report that's been around for a number of years with lots of good GP anomalies on that, that's, that flank of the, the range, and several com companies have explored there in the past. Um, the company that I was looking for wanted to do detailed gravity and that flank of the range to see if they could better understand the geology and advance the project. And this was actually done in 2008 and prior. This was actually before that, that satellite data, data actually existed. 
to the whole ground chief visit program was undertaken. And then just after doing the work in Eritrea, I wanted to go back and look and see what, what, would, have, what would have happened if we would have had that, that satellite gravity data back at that time. So here you can see a topographic map for the, the north central Great Basin. Here the main feature is you've got the, the nice sheep crypt range comes down here. Our project area, the, the area of interest is right here in this blue outland area right along the western, southwestern flank of the sheep crypt range. <clears throat> Again, the topo, topo is on the left hand side. The right hand side is the public domain gravity database, the, the individual gravity stations with the blue dots. And again, you can see the, the area of interest is here. The Sheep Creek Range itself is generally a gravity high. Notice there is no gravity anomaly within our area of interest. And this is after all train corrections have been calculated up to the standard 167 kilometers. Uh, now, we, if we pull it up and look at, again, the, the public domain gravity data on the left and the EGM-08 model, they're distinctly different from right our area of interest. You can see here in the where the satellite data has been merged with the ground gravity data, there's actually a, a pretty good <coughs> size gravity anomaly in our area of interest. So, it, yeah, as I said, the field work was all done prior to any of the satellite data, the public available. So, the region or uh, uh, gravity survey was carried out uh, with about a station every 300 meters of the and then the detailed uh, magnet was done with 150 meters of the and again, this is the, the sheep tree drain, which is quite steep. In this particular area, the gravity on the consists of here, basically right here at the base of the mountain. Again, looking at, we've just winded out the data for our area of interest. This is the result of the ground um, gravity survey. It shows a very strong, roughly a 15 milligal high, depending on where you want to pick the background, if it's on the video, you could say it's even bigger than that, might say a bit lower. But Definitely a strong gravity high that extends throughout the length of the area of interest. And there, here also shown the, the drill holes that were drilled by the company, as well as a single gravity model. Again, the, the gravity data on the left, and then the magnetic data. The, the magnetic survey was never completed. That was 2000. The company started running out of money fast. But in this case, you can see when you have this, this large gravity anomaly that's elongated along the area of interest, but at various points, there's slight weakness in that, where it looks like there's almost maybe a cross-cutting feature that's cutting across that, with the possible fault that's, that's causing that, that, a bit of a lower gravity density. And in those same areas, you get a little bit higher elevated of, of the magnetic response from here to here. And it became even more interesting. Chris Capps is the most the project geologist on this. And he wrote all this up in the last some of those presentations in 2010 if you want to go into more detail about the geology of this project. But he was mapping a series of cross-cutting faults, and he was finding that these faults were occurring about the same place that these the cutoffs in the gravity data come. They come from here, they come from here. And so Chris and I were talking over, and what we really think this is, is this big gravity anomaly is actually more central than that here. The USGS has picked it on the, the right on the edge of the Sheep Creek Range, and that's mainly based on the old Murray Airborne Mag survey. You just happen to get a tick from that, that flat line magnetic body that is over the top of it, and pick out a nice magnetic trend. We think that the actual the more central Nevada rift is actually the base of that one, and it corresponds with its gravity high. And then Chris's thinking is that these cross cutting faults would produce conflicts, bring mineralization to the surface. And so those became a primary target for the wind and water drilling. Here again, we're looking at this gravity anomaly that's in the ground gravity data, and we see actually a very simple feature that appears in the satellite data, but not in the original gravity data, which makes you think that maybe it has enough resolution to actually see that. Because it is, if you're looking at a nine kilometer cell size, or if it's been desktopized for four and a half, you ought to expect a resolution of about four and a half if you're really optimistic, two kilometers, and if you have a strong anomaly, you might be able to detect it the satellite. And this one example seems to suggest that it is. But it has to be a strong anomaly, it has to be about three kilometers in the channel. So anyway, we, we 
a new gravity anomaly was identified by the ground survey. I mean, that's more central Nevada lift. The program was developed to go after these, these magpies that seem to be associated with these cross cutting faults. Really did it intersects fire mineralization with elevated um, metals counts, with maybe not, definitely not bonanza grade, but certainly elevated counts. And it's updated the geologic model for how, what may be going on in the system, why these geological anomalies are occurring in this area. This large gravity high could have been identified from the EGM 2008 data that had been available at the time, which makes you think that if you have another project, this data is free. It's easy to you can just window off where you're looking at and you click it. You know, if you see a gravity anomaly that shows up in there that doesn't show up in the, in the public domain database, you may want to send a crew out there to see if you can confirm that anomaly. I, you know, I definitely wouldn't stick around just based on the size of the gravity data, but it, it, you know, if you get one more point, it helps your exploration advance the project. The BGI train correction seems sufficient. I've kind of, since I, for the past few months, I've been trying to see if I could improve train corrections, but I'm not a good enough program, apparently. I haven't been able to get the thing to work, so I'm still going to fight for that a bit, hopefully, in the coming months. Okay, well then, just as a quick example, just the, kind of the, one of the two nice things about the satellite gravity is that they've incorporated lots of data that's not actually publicly available. So I just, as an actual extra item, I want to go ahead and just include an example from the Baikal lift in Siberia. The only, at the present time, the only publicly released data that Russia has from their gravity data, which is a very good data for the former Soviet Union, is only good at a one degree interval, which is very good. The Baikal lift occurs on the southern margin of the um, Siberian Craton, it's a very strong gravity load. And but the NGA, the NGA was providing all the data from Russia to incorporate this model at a 15 part minute interval. So it's a way of getting a look at data that you can't look at if you just go to the, the data as it's released from the Russian government. Here again is, is Lake Baikal, which is I believe it's the deepest freshwater lake in the world. And here you can see the outlines of the See it, this is a Google Earth image of the southern margin of the, the Siberian Craton. On the, the left hand side, you have the public domain release gravity data as at the one arc minute interval by Russia. You can roughly see where that, the Baikal lift is here. And you compare that to what's available from the GMO 8 database. You can look more sharply at this. You can look well find the, the um, Siberian Craton. And it's even better once you move away the framework for the geologic map. Very the geologic maps are working on both data sets. You know, it really doesn't it would be hard pressed to find anything just based upon the data that the Russian government's public release or is what they've allowed to be released within this model. You can clearly see the outside outline of the, the various structures that come up here along the, the Siberian Crater. So in conclusion, uh, the EGEN 08 database can be uh, very accurate, but I think the crucial level is you have to have good ground data control. But the stuff for, you know, I know other people that tried to use this data in, in Africa or, um, have had terrible luck just because there's no ground data to constrain it. Now, similarly, if I was looking at a, a big gravity anomaly in, in the Big Basin, but there were no ground gravity stations there, I'd be very suspicious of that as well. You have pretty good control from the ground gravity data, and you see a you know anomaly that appears in the satellite data that's not present in the ground data. Then it becomes more interesting because it, you know it, it's a least squared inversion, and you're throwing all these different data sources in from different locations. But maybe that's an actual real gravity anomaly. The train corrections appear to be acceptable. I, I would like to improve as you know, if you could just window out the Great Basin and do a, a train correction using much more detailed uh, topographic data rather than just relying on. Data set, but it seems like that would improve the model as well. But of course, the, the biggest advantage of the scene is the data are all free to download. You know, it doesn't take you very long to put out your pictures, put it in on, on your GIS program, and see how it compares with, with the other results. And it can be used in the exploration tools in, in the mature exploration areas of the world. I uh, would like to thank NGA for releasing this data, making it available, and for BGI and for today for. Producing a complete Google analysis for the entire globe. 
the field work at, in the air trail was done by MWH and the facilities. They have an in house person on Salmon and thank the Salmon Resources and Chris Capps for allowing me to present the data. Try to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, you know, of the companies that have toured around here, it's in the most of the mineralization that's of higher grade has not been found around the same stone area. Any other questions? Mr. Clark? 